welcome to this special session of the Mahindra Humanities Seminar in Book History, co-sponsored by the Department of Music and Kate Van Orden, Dwight P. Robinson, Jr. Professor of Music here at Harvard University. It gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce Roger Chartier, Director of Studies at the École des Hautes Études and Sciences Sociales, and holder of the Chair of Rich and Culture in Modern Europe at the Collège de France. In the past four decades, and in a series of landmark publications, Roger Chartier has staked out new paths for book history and cultural history, and established entirely new fields, from the history of reading to the history of education. In the Anglophone world, his 1987 book, The Cultural Uses of Print in Early Modern France, helped set the terms for studies of print culture. In 1988, his cultural history between practices and representations provided crucial methodologies for a new generation of cultural histories. And his order of books from 1994 on readers, authors, and libraries in early modern Europe has been a standard in book history courses since it hit the shelves. These monographs, and there are many of them, need also to be seen in light of Chartier's extraordinary leadership as an editor and collaborator. Despite only the magnificent four volume um, Histoire de l'édition française, co-edited with Henri-Jean Martin, the history of private life with Philippe Arias and Georges Duby, and his edited collection on the culture of print brings us only to 1989, <coughs> and even so leaves much out. A quick search of WorldCat is overwhelming even when you apply limits, and if you want to try typing Roger Chartier into your smartphone, it will plunge you into labyrinths of translations into Portuguese, German, and Japanese, and decades of re-editions and anthologized essays. Indeed, I dare say that only a scholar with Chartier's own remarkable ability to assess vast, fluctuating repertories and interpret the complex relationships among authors, editors, translators, printers, and publishers could possibly make sense of his own publication history. For myself, to borrow a line from Anne Blair, it's too much to know. And this <laughs> and these <coughs> publications resist all attempts at synopsis. The same is true of his professional accomplishments and awards. The Officer of the Legion of Honor, the Prix Gobert from the Académie Française, Corresponding Fellow from the British Academy, and multiple honorary degrees, to say nothing of his professorship at the Collège de France. So forgive me. If instead of an overview, I take this moment to speak to the spirit that animates Professor Chartier's work. One strong quality is a particular brand of curiosity that favors the marginalized, offbeat, unstable, neglected, the badly printed pamphlet, the unauthorized edition, the riffraff books that channel the heartbeat of the popular press. His is a curiosity guided by a deep humanity, unrestrained by social prejudice and unbounded by language and geography, something we see expressed in the subject of today's lecture on Global Cervantes and in his own globe-trotting as an educator, which brings him not only to the United <coughs> States, where since 2001, he's been visiting, Annenberg visiting professor of history at the University of Pennsylvania, but also to Mexico, Spain, Brazil, and Argentina. I myself was the beneficiary 
of a transformative graduate course Professor Chalfier taught at the University of Chicago in 1994, during which we read his forms and meanings in TypeScript. And I think I still have the photocopies. I should have dug them out for today. It was really exciting. And just this afternoon, he spent hours with the students in my PhD seminar, giving feedback on their projects and evincing the same scholarly generosity that I've been trying to pay forward since first meeting him in 1994. Finally, Roger Chantier is a scholar who listens, who's present in the moment, a quality that allows him to illuminate past practices and performances, the pauses and pitches of reading aloud, the space before the page, caressed by the breath, the embodied active ways that readers mobilize their books. This spirit shines brightly in his most recent book, The Author's Hand and the Printer's Mind. This reflex, if you will, gives his work a marvelous open-ended quality that calls us to action incites a response, and animates our own work with the joy of contributing to the conversations that he has begun, each in our own language, in our own terms, musical, literary, historical, sociological. Tonight, the topic is Global Cervantes, and I anticipate that we're in for another horizon expanding offering from one of my favorite scholars. Now I have one announcement before we begin. Tonight's lecture is being live streamed by the Instituto Cervantes, which means that during the question session, your voice is gonna be captured on audio if you ask a question. And so by doing so, you're automatically consenting to be recorded. <laughs> and now, Roger Chalfier, Global Cervantes. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Kate for a very generous, uh, too generous, uh, so moving uh, introduction. And I would like also to thank her, to thank uh, Andrea and uh, Francisco Moreno for their very kind uh, invitation. It is uh, for me a great pleasure to come back to be again at uh, Howard, where I have so many friends, and many of them are uh, here tonight, this evening, in order to share some thought about global Cervantes or the globalization of Cervantes. According to Franco Moretti in his Atlas of the European Novel, literary geography, I quote Moretti, literary geography can refer to two very different things. It may indicate the study of space in literature or else of literature in space. The second perspective, literature in space, considered the book as a commodity, une marchandise, to quote Fevre and Martin, and maps the places of publication of a work and the chronology of its translations. The first perspective, space in literature, maps the geographical settings of the plots, the travels of the characters, the places of their encounters. It does not deal with the historical space of the circulation of the book, but with the internal space of the fiction. It is in this double perspective, historical and textual, that I would map uh, Cervantes geographies and approach global Cervantes. In chapter three of the second part of Don Quixote, published in 1615, Don Quixote asks the bachelor Sanson Carrasco who is returning from Salamanca. So then, is it true that my history exists and that it was composed by the wise Moor? The young man responds, it is so true that I believe that there are more than 12,000 copies of this history in print today. If you do not think so, 
let Portugal, Barcelona, and Valencia tell you so, for they were printed there. There is even a rumor that it is being printed in Antwerp. The figure of 12,000 copies of Cervantes' book put on the market between 1605 and 1615 is completely plausible, given that by the later date, nine editions of the book had been published, three in Madrid, two in 1605, one in 1608, two in Lisbon, in Castilian, both in 1605, one in Valencia, 1605, but none in Barcelona, and one in Milan, and two in Brussels, but not Antwerp, in 1607 and 1611. <coughs> the geography is the one of the territories ruled by the king of a composite monarchy that associated the crowns of Castile, Aragon, and since uh, 1580 on, Portugal. Whereas the privilege given to Cervantes on September 26, 1604, was only valid for Nuestros Reinos de Castilla, our Kingdom of Castile, a privilege for Portugal, dated February the 2nd, 1605, was added in the second edition printed in Madrid, and the same day, a privilege for Aragon was given to Cervantes by the Viceroy of Valencia. These new privileges allow the publication in the year 1605 of the two editions printed in Lisbon with licencias of the Inquisition and the edition printed in Valencia. According to 17th century printer's manual, such as the Institución y Origen del Arte de la Imprenta, composed around 1680 by Alonso Victor de Paredes, the average press run for an edition was 1,500 copies. This means that there were probably some 30, uh, 13,500 copies of Don Quixote in Castilian circulating in the 10 years that followed the Princeps edition printed at the end of 1604 in the Madrid printing shop of Juan de la Cuesta for the bookseller Francisco de Robles. Sanson Carrasco added in his answer to Don Quixote, and it is evident to me that every nation or language will have its translation of the book. Indeed, two translations of Don Quixote had already been published before 1615. In 1612, the English translation by Thomas Shelton, and in 1614, the French translation by César Houdin. The second part of the work was first translated into French by François de Rosset, 1618, and then in English, by the same Thomas Shelton in 1620. The Italian translation followed this shortly, 1622. The German one was printed in 1648, but only with the 23 first chapters of the first part. And the Dutch translation was printed a little later in 1657. As shown by Moretti, a second wave of translation occurred in the peripheral and enlightened Europe between 1769 and 1802. Translation in Russia, Denmark, Poland, Portugal, and Sweden. The third wave took place between 1813 and 1896 and was contemporary of the affirmation of national identities. It led to the translation of Don Quixote in the different languages of the territory that compose the Ottoman Empire, Mittel Europa, the Russian Empire, and later Asia, with a translation of Don Quixote into Chinese, Persian, Hindi, and Japanese. In Western Europe, the cartography of the first translation must not hide an important phenomenon. The publication in the late 17th and 18th century of new translation of works already translated, either because the new translation declared taking into account the transformation of the language of the translation, or because they uh, affirm to translate the work from a true and original copy or from its best new editions. For Don Quixote, the series began in England in 1687 with John Phillips translation. John Phillips was uh, Milton's nephew, that presented the text as, I quote, new made English 
according the humor of our modern language. Philip's translation was followed by five other translations that claimed to be revised and corrected. Motus' translation in 1700 is given as, I quote, translated from the original by several hands. Stevens' translation, published in the same year, is presented as a new edition of Shelton's translation, quote, now revised, corrected, and partly new, translated from the original. Ozel's translation in 1719 is said, carefully revised and compared with the best edition of the original printed in Madrid. Whereas Jarvis translation in 1742 and Smollett translation in 1755 both claim to be, I quote, translated from the original Spanish of Miguel de Cervantes. We could say that uh, with this multiple translation, seven in English uh, between Shelton and uh, 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 Smollett, with this numerous translation, Don Quixote became the most popular English novel of the 18th century, a novel that deeply transformed the horizon of expectation of the readers. It is the reception of Don Quixote that made possible novel written by Fielding, Smollett himself, and Stern. In France, the first translation by Houdin and Rosset had a longer resistance in spite of two new translations made by the Jansenist Fillot de Saint-Martin in 1677-78, a translation in which Don Quixote didn't die, allowing new sequels written by Fillot de Saint-Martin himself, and another one by Florian in 1799 that abridged the work by suppressing what Florian designated as, I quote, repetition and digression to the banal, and by, I quote, drastically compressing the narrations. The French translations were often used for the translation of Don Quixote in other languages. The case of the Russian translation illustrates this frequent phenomenon of translation of translations. The first one in Russia, printed in 1769, was a translation of Fio de Saint-Martin translation, as was the second one published by Nicolas Ozipov in 1791. The third translation, Vasily Zhukovsky translation in six volumes published between 1804 and 1806, was a translation of Florian's translation. It is only in 1838 that Konstantin Masalski translated Cervantes from the Spanish language. The editorial geography of Cervantes novelas ejemplares, the exemplary novels, reproduced with the, the same pattern than Don Quixote's translation, but with some variations. The Princeps edition in 1613 was published by Francisco de Robles and printed in the printing shop of Juan de la Cuesta with a tenure privilege for Castile and Aragon. It was followed the year after, by three editions in Spain, one in Pamplona, with a privilege for the Kingdom of Navarra, one in Brussels, and one printed in Lisbon or Seville, we don't know, but with the false address of Madrid. Other editions in Spanish followed soon, Milan, Madrid, Barcelona, Seville. In 1614, François de Rosset and Vital Diguier began to translate the book in French, each one for his own. They decided finally to collaborate, and in 1615, the novelas ejemplares were published in French as Nouvelle de Miguel de Cervantes. The five editions of the Nouvelle, printed before the mid 17th century, fully confirm the success of the book. Cervantes' novels were also translated into Italian and published in Venice as early as 1626 by Guglielmo Alessandro de Novilieri Clavelli under the title Il Novelliere Castigliano di Michel di Cervantes Saavedra. The following year, in 1627, another translator, Donato Fontana, published in Milan a second translation, translation of Cervantes' novelas. At the difference of the French and Italian translation, and at the difference of Don Quixote, whose first translation was Shelton's one in English, the English translation of the novelas ejemplares waited a little more. 
It was published only in 1640 and with uh, only six novels as exemplary novels in six books full of various accidents, both delightful and profitable, turned into English by Don Diego Puedeser, which is a curious and rare example of the translation of the translator's name, that is to say, James Maybe, Diego Puedeser, who had previously this uh, James Maybe, the uh, previously translated Guzman de Alfarache as a Spanish rogue in 1622, and La Cristina as a Spanish bode in 1631. A new edition of the six novels appeared in 1654 without the name of the translator, this time Puedeser, but with the prize of the author on the title page, delight in several shapes drawn to the life in six pleasant histories by the elegant pen of that famous Spaniard Don Miguel de Cervantes, the same that wrote Don Quixote, and Don Quixote was just republished in 1652, the year before. It is only in 1741 that will be published the first English translation of two of the main novel, novel or nobe, uh, novelas, El Colloquio de los Perros and Rinconete, Rinconete y Cortadillo, gathered in the same book under the title of Two Humorous Novels. Editions and translation are not sufficient, however, it seems to me, for drawing the cartography of the circulation of the work and, in a sense, the afterlife of the author. Other geographies are necessary, and in first instance, the mapping of the places and dates of the various embodiments of the fictional characters. It was very early on that Don Quixote and his companions emerged from the pages that told their adventure and made their appearance in courtly amusements and popular masquerades. In 1608, on the occasion of the entry of the Duke of Lerma, the valido of Philippe III, into the town of du Tudela del Duero, the corrida that took place in the square in front of the town, town hall included, I quote, the Aventuras del Caballero Don Quixote. One year earlier, in 1607, the knight errant had found himself on the other side of the Atlantic, taking part with other famous chivalric knights in the just organized by the Corregida of Paosa, the then very small capital of the province of Parinacochas and Peru. One of the competitors had chosen to appear not as a knight uh, coming from the chivalric novel, but according to the relation of the event, as the Caballero de la Triste Figura, Don Quixote de la Mancha, como lo pintan en su libro, as he is depicted in his book. Indeed, the book of Don Quixote was certainly not unknown in the Spanish Indies. Even if the claim made by Irving Leonard that close on the whole of the first edition was dispatched to America seems somewhat exaggerated, the fact remains, nevertheless, that a very large number of copies of the Historia written by Cervantes had arrived in Mexico and Peru by 1605 and 1606, either because the transatlantic book trade between some Spanish booksellers and American uh, correspondents, or because transatlantic travelers brought the book with them. Cervantes' heroes remain familiar figures present in many festivals in Spain. For instance, in Salamanca in 1610, during the festivity celebrating the beatification of Ignatius of Loyola, the students perform a picaresque masquerade devoted to El Triunfo de Don Quixote. The, this comic triumph of Don Quixote performed at the heart of the religious celebrations, which uh, was, uh, have, have a duration of one week, was enjoyed by all the spectators, but as a report of the festivities notes, in particular by those who had read his book. The formula that combined the pleasant presence of Don Quixote and the devout prayers addressed 
to recently new saints, Ignatius of Loyola or Teresa de Avila, was a feature that reappeared in Saragossa in 1614, in, 1614, in Cordova in 1615, in Seville in 1617, and in Baeza Utrero in 1618. Likewise, on the American continent, in Mexico in 1621, the night errant was present in the festival organized by the worker of the Plateria Real on the occasion of the beatification of San Isidro. The stages proposed another form of embodiment to the heroes of the fiction. Before Pamela, before Paul and Virginie, Don Quixote, Cardenio, and other protagonists of Cervantes' book became theatrical characters. In this case, the geography of the adaptation followed the chronology of the edition and translation. Very soon after the publication of the book in Madrid, possibly in 1605 or 1606, and certainly before 1608, the Valencian playwright Guillén de Castro composed a comedia in three acts entitled Don Quixote de la Mancha. During the early months of 1613, the king's men performed before the court of England a play entitled Cardeno or Cardena, which is without any doubt the first English theatrical adaptation appropriating the uh, love story of Cardenio, which is inscribed by Cervantes within the Don Quixote, and perhaps appropriated also, but we don't know, the uh, history of the knight errant himself. As you know, and this is a large parenthesis in order to uh, uh, be uh, in accordance with the posture of this, uh, 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 of this lecture, I would like to, to spend some time with this uh, first theatrical uh, adaptation outside of Spain of uh, Don Quixote. As you know, in the last 15 years, the quest for this play, Cardenio, a lost play, never printed and without a surviving manuscript, became a good plot for detective novels, a challenge taken by many playwrights, for example, uh, Stephen Greenblatt, and uh, your stage directors, and an academic copious industry to which, perhaps unfortunately, I have uh, contributed myself. I do not want to tell once again a well-known and perhaps worn-out story. I just want to come back briefly to the documents of the 17th century that indicated the presence of Cervantes' book in England and that associated it in a manner or another with Shakespeare's name. It is in 1605 that Cervantes' book, Don Quixote, entered into the Bodleian Library. Apparently, a copy was purchased in Spain by the London bookseller John Bill. Bill had been sent in Spain by Sir Thomas Bodley for buying books using the donation of 100 pounds made by the Earl of Southampton for the acquisition of Spanish books by the library. Don Quixote and Southampton gift were recorded in the benefactor's register of the library with the date of 1605. And Cervantes' book was probably received in August 1605, which explains what it is not mentioned in the earliest catalog of the collection. Another copy of Don Quixote was surely brought, brought to England by Dudley Carlton, one among the gentlemen of condition quality that have accompanied the Earl of Nottingham during his embassy in Spain in the spring of 1605 to confirm the peace the treaty of peace signed the year before in London. In a letter sent to his friend John Chamberlain in November 1605, Carlton wrote, whilst I was in Spain, I bestowed much in books because they are rare of that language in England. The following year, in a letter dated on May 11, 1606, he wrote to the same Chamberlain, I send you Don Quixote challenge, which is translated into whole languages and sent into the wide world. 
This allusion remains obscure. We don't know exactly which challenge Dudley Carlton had in mind. And in 1606, Don Quixote's book was not translated in any language. But the hyperbolic remark can take place within the corpus of the first English references to Cervantes Historia. The series is well known now. Some indications are without any ambiguity, as in Ben Jonson, Epiphany, or The Silent Woman, or The Alchemist, likely composed in 1609 and 1610, that explicitly associate Don Quixote and Amadis de Gaulle. Or, as the use of the novella del Curioso Impertinente, three chapters in the first part of Don Quixote, for a subplot by Middleton in the second maiden tragedy, a play written in 1609-1610. Other indications are less evident, as are the expression to fight with windmill in a play by George Wilkins and another by Middleton in 1607, even if it seems that there were no use of this formula, of this comparison, before Don Quixote. Or other ambiguous indication, the complex chronological relationship between the night of the burning pestle uh, by Beaumont and Don Quixote. It is certain, however, that Don Quixote, the book and the character, were present in England as early as 1605 on. When did Shakespeare meet them, the book and the character? Two documents, but only two, suggest a possible answer. The first one is an account prepared for the treasurer of the chamber that registers two payments to the king's men made a quote, upon the council's warrant, meaning a warrant from the privy council. Dated on May 20, 1613, the warrant orders the payment of 40 pounds plus 20 pounds, I quote, by way of his majesty's reward to Johnny Mings and the company of the king's men for having performed at the court six plays during the previous months. Among them is a play of which the title is given as Cardeno, with two N. One month later, on July 9, another six pounds, 13 shillings, and four pence are paid to the same John Emmings, I quote, for himself and the rest of his fellows, his majesty's servants and players, for the performance of a play called Cardena, performed before the Duke of Savoy ambassador, who had been the guest of the English sovereign. When to question first, is Cardena and Cardeno the same place? The carelessness of the scribe and the easy confusion between O and A, A make it likely. Secondly, is Cardeno Cardenio, the young Andalusian lover of Lucinda in Don Quixote? It is also likely because the absence of this foreign proper name in England before the circulation of Cervantes' book. We can assume thus that the play performed in 1613 was a story of Cardenio, who has exchanged woes and promises of marriage with Lucinda and was betrayed by his friend Fernando, the Duke's son. In 1613, Cardenio was the first English play staging the adventure of some character of Don Quixote, with or without the uh, Hidalgo and his squire Sancho on the stage, we don't know. But it was a play without author or authors. It is only 40 years later, second document, that the registers of the writing copy of the Stationers Company indicated the names. On September 9, 1653, the bookseller Humphrey Mosley, I quote, entered for his copies 42 plays. The tense is, an, is entered as the history of Cardenio, comma, by Master Fletcher, period, and Shakespeare. This title is one of the two sentences that associate Shakespeare and Cervantes Don Quixote in England before 1660. Must we take it at a face value? The mention of the collaboration between Master Fletcher and uh, Shakespeare, for the history of Cardenio, is of course plausible. During the year 1613, they wrote together two plays, All is True, published in the 1623 folio as the life of Henry VIII, and The Two Noble Kinsmen, 
published with the two names, but only in 1634. Cardenium may have been the first of their three collaborations since the play was likely performed in January or February 1613. The analogies between the plots of Cardenio in Don Quixote and the uh, plot of the two noble kinsmen that are both stories of the brutal destruction of a perfect friendship between two young men often express this friendship in the lexicon of true love. This friendship ruined by the passion they share for the same woman, this parallelism of the plot gives some credibility to the hypothesis of a collaborative play. But with the history of Cardenio, would it really uh, meet uh, Cervantes' book, Shakespeare or Fletcher? Fletcher, whose name is the first attached to the play in the register of the uh, Stationers' Company, was much more familiar than Shakespeare with Cervantes' book. Before 1613, he has already used the novel of the Curioso Impertinente in his play, The Cock Comb, composed between 1608 and 1610. And after this date, 1613, Fletcher will come back to Don Quixote in two plays, use the exemplary novels in four, and plays composed between 1616 and 1626, and use also Cervantes' last work, the travels of Persiles and Sigismunda in another play. Fletcher clearly knows Spanish, since, as I said, the novelas ejemplares were translated into English, and only six of them, only in 1640. What was the role of Shakespeare in the possible collaboration between the two playwrights? And did, in fact, Shakespeare collaborate to the history of Cardenio? The doubt could be introduced because mostly the entries are not always very accurate for uh, uh, Shakespeare. In 1653, this uh, uh, royalist uh, uh, publisher attributed to Shakespeare, I quote in the same uh, 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 entry in the register, The Merry Devil of Edmonton, a play published anonymously in 1608, and Henry I and Henry II by Shakespeare and Davenport, a play that was licensed by the Master of Revels in 1624 and attributed to the sole Davenport. Some years after, in an entry in the register of the Stationers' Company dated June 29, 1660, mostly attributed to Will Shakespeare, three plays still more mysterious. The History of King Stephen, Duke Humphrey, a tragedy, and if is any anta, or a marriage without man, a comedy. Remains, however, a possible clue in spite of this doubt of the uh, inaccuracy of the name attributed to the play by uh, Mosley in his uh, entries. Remains, however, a possible clue of Shakespeare's authorship in the play registered in 1653. Its title itself. As observed by Gary Taylor, the formula, the history of, occurs in six plays printed by Shakespeare, enfin, six plays by Shakespeare printed before 1613. And none of the Fletcher's plays used this phrase in their title, and no other playwright used it so frequently. Shakespeare was perhaps also inspired by the title given by Shelton to his translation, The History of the Valorous and Witty Knight Errant, Don Quixote of the Mancha. So in 1653, the play performed at the court 40 years before, in 1613, has acquired two authors and a title, The History of Cardenio. But it remained without uh, any 17th century text except perhaps a song. The song Woods, Rocks, and Mountain, and the Desert Places, composed by Robert Johnson, a Latinist and composer associated with the King's Men since 1609, and a sign to the lost play by Michael Wood, who considers it as the lamentation of Dorothea betrayed by Fernando and retired in the Sierra Morena. 
In his pleasant notes upon Don Quixote, published in 1654, Edmund Gayton presented this lamento as if it was a song sung by an extraordinary pleasant voice. And as if he, Gayton, has attended the performance of the play in which Dorothea was singing. Even if Gayton does not uh, associate in his text Dorothea's song, which is perhaps the only remnant of the lost history of Cardinal with Shakespeare, he is the first author, I think, to associate in the same sentence Don Quixote and Shakespeare. Second the, uh, association after the title entered by Mosley. The association occurs in one of the notes written by uh, Edmund Gayton to the chapter 19, where Don Quixote and Sancho meet a good number of men bringing torches. Sancho is frightened and, translated Shelton, his courage abated and he did shatter with his teeth. In the note attached to this line, Don Quixote, uh, in Gayton's book, declared, What make thee shake? What make thy teeth to chatter? Look on thy don, the Shakespeare of the Mancha, whose chief defense I am. Gayton, who made numerous references in his very curious book, the pleasant notes upon Don Quixote to the plays and playwright, and among them to Shakespeare, referred by name uh, three times, is adding here a new pun on Shakespeare's name. After Green, 1593, Shake Scene, and after Thomas Bancroft in 1639, Thou hast to you thy pen or shook thy spear. But he is also inverting a trope frequently used during the Civil War in the pamphlets and news books during the uh, English Revolution, the enemies were often ridiculed as the Quixote of this age. Defender of the parliament or supporter of the king were mocked for their Quixotal chimeras by their adversaries who considered them as Don Quixote. Edmund Gayton turned the comparison upside down. With him, the Spanish knight of the Mancha became English. Like a modern enchanter, Gayton transformed Shakespeare's pen into Don Quixote spear. In France, Don Quixote appeared also in courtly festivities, for example, two ballets, Dance in the Louvre in 1614 and 1620. The first French play based on Don Quixote, written by Pichou, was performed by the company of the Hotel of Bourgogne in 1628 and printed two years after. Pichou's choice was similar to the one made in London in 1613 by Fletcher and perhaps Shakespeare. The title of his tragic comedy was Les Folies de Cardenio. Even in this case, we can be sure, because the text exists, that Don Quixote and Sancho appeared in the play. Ten years later, another French playwright, Daniel Guérin de Bouscal, based three plays on Cervantes' book. In 1639 and 40, the two parts of his Don Quixote de la Manche, and in 1642, le gouvernement de Sanz Panza, which was the first of a long series of theatrical adaptation of the episode of the island of Barataria and of the government of Sancho Panza. Indeed, Sancho's government and other episodes of the second part inspired numerous plays in all Europe. Spectacle for the fairs, for example, in Paris, Foire Saint-Germain, Foire Saint-Laurent. Comedies in Paris by Dufresne, 1694, Dancourt, 1712. Operas, for example, the two operas composed in 1727 and 1733 by Antonio Caldara for the court of Vienna. Don Quixote, Don Quixote in Corte de la Duquesa et Sancho Panza, Governatore de l'Isola Barataria. And plays for puppets for the uh, uh, marionette, like the Vida do Granchi Don Quixote de la Mancha, written by Antonio José da Silva for the theater of the Bero Alto in Lisbon in 1733. This first chronogeography of Cervantes Don Quixote between 1605 and the mid-18th century can teach us perhaps 
some methodological lessons. The circulation of a text, thanks to its edition, translation, or theatrical adaptation, must always be considered as a permanent reinvention of the work. Literary geography does not map the spatial distribution of a stable textual entity, but mobile reconfiguration of what is mapped. In the case of the textual geographies, apparently easy to follow by studying the circulation of books, the challenge is to understand how publishers, translators, playwrights, engravers produced a new text within the constraint imposed by the work they appropriated and by the genre they chose. It seems that for the playwright of the 17th and 18th century, the book written by Cervantes was first and foremost a repertory of short stories, of novellas, that could be transformed easily into plots for the theater with or without the presence of Don Quixote. It was the case with this novel of the Curioso Impertinente used as a secondary plot in Middleton, the second Middleton tragedy, as early as 1611, or what I call the novella of Cardenio. But the festivals, whatever their nature may be, aristocratic, popular, religious, and the series of illustrations put into the book, which began with a Dutch translation published in Dordrecht in 1657, privileged the character and episode of Don Quixote's adventures and misadventures, whereas they generally ignored the protagonist of scene or scenes of the novels inserted into the Historia. As we have acknowledged at the beginning, Franco Moretti's definition of textual geography has a second meaning related to the spaces within the texts themselves. In his novelas ejemplares, Cervantes inscribed in his short stories multiple forms of mobility, implying various geographies. Commercial exchanges, crossing Castile, migration of people from the north of Spain traveling south in search of work, returns of new wealthy people from America, the Peruleros who came back from Peru, it was the case, for example, of Filippo de Carizales, El Celoso Estremeño, the jealous old man from Extremadura, who, I quote, finding that he was so short of money and even shorter of friends, he resorted to that course of action to which many other Westerners in that city turned and he departed for the new world. El pasarse a las Indias. Las Indias, the uh, Spanish uh, colonies, in America are, in Cervantes' cosmography, like a Spain turned upside down. The other land where, I quote, the desperate men of Spain look for refuge and shelter, bankrupt seeks an haven, cutthroats a self-conduct, and where asylum is given to those card shops whom, profession, whom professional card players call ciertos, and with a woman of easy virtue are lured. There are many end up deluded and a few find satisfaction. Engaño común de muchos y remedio particular de poco. In Peru, Carizales found remedio and not engaño, satisfaction and not delusion. I quote, in the 20 years that he spent there, through his hard work and application, he managed to amass a fortune worth than 150,000 solid gold pesos. The main geography of the novelas ejemplares is, however, the one that follows the captures, escapes, and rescues of Christian prisoners sent by the Turks to the Banyos, the prison in Algiers, or on the Ottoman galleys. In La Illustre Fregona, the illustrious kitchen maid, the picaros who work in the tiny fisheries of the Andalusian coast are constantly at the mercy of Barbary coarser raids. In La Española Inglesa, the English Spanish girl, the young English but Catholic coarser Ricaredo captures two Turkish galleys, frees the Christian slaves and also 20 Turks in order to hide his love towards Catholic prisoners 
and he comes back to England with, I quote, a ship previously captured by the corsair Arnaute Mami from Portuguese India loaded with spices and with so many pearls and diamonds that it was worth more than a million ducats in gold. The chapters 39 to 41 of the first part of Don Quixote, which are perhaps another form of novella within the Historia, recounts the history of a Christian captive, Rui Perez de Viedma, captured during the 1571 Battle of Lepanto. Viedma was sent to Constantinople. He roved the galleys in the navy of the Grand Turk and finally found himself in Algiers, I quote, locked in a prison or house that the Turks called a bagno, where they all Christian captives. He is thus an imagined double, resembling yet different from Cervantes himself, who was also captured by Turkish corsairs, but off the Catalan coast in 1575, and found himself in Algiers, from which he repeatedly attempted to escape. But where he has a captive in the uh, Quixote triumph in his endeavor, accompanied by the beautiful and already Christian Zoraida, Cervantes only regained his liberty upon being ransomed by the Trinitarian five years after his capture in a monetary conjuncture that was, according to Brodel, particularly favorable to Spanish coins in the marketplace of Algiers in this year. In La Española Inglesa, Ricaredo is likewise rescued by the father of the Holy Trinity, having been captured by some Turkish corsairs off the coast of Provence at a place called Les Trois Maris. I quote, they took us in Algiers, where he is speaking, the, uh, uh, Ricaredo. They took us in Algiers, where I have found the father of the Holy Trinity were engaged in ransoming prisoners. I spoke to them and told them that who I was, and moved by charity, even though I was a foreigner, because in an English, Catholic, but English, they ransomed me. The, so, you see, end of quote. The entire Iberian and Mediterranean geography gives a fabric upon which are embroidered the motifs, first of the Quixotic adventure, but remaining within the space of Spain, and then the wider space of the exemplary novels. Such a geography, associated in Cervantes' imagination, but also in Cervantes' life, the Mediterranean world, and America. In a memoir written on May 5, 1590, Cervantes requested an office, a cargo vacante en contadurías o corregimiento, an office vacant either in a fiscal or financial administration in Nueva Gradana, Cartagena de las Indias, or La Paz, or in a court, in this case, in Guatemala. In spite of his 22 years of military campaign, and in spite of his glorious wound in the Battle of Lepanto, El Consejo de las Indias turned down his request with the indication, busque por acá que se, que se le haga merced. Look how to make him a favor by here. In Don Quixote, the brothers of Rui Perez de Viedma, the captive escaped from Algiers, were more lucky. After the father gave them an equal share of his fortune, Rui Perez, the uh, captive, the older brother, said that his desire, I quote, was to follow the profession of arms and in that way serve God and his king. What he did in taking part in the glorious battle of Lepanto before being captured. The second brother, I quote, chose to go to the Indies and like the Extremeño Carrizales, became a very rich man in Peru. The third, the youngest brother, Juan Perez de Viedma, quote, said he wanted to enter the church and complete the studies he had begun at Salamanca. He became licentiated at, and a judge. He meets the older brother, the escape, the uh, uh, captive, when he is going to Sevilla for leaving to New Spain, I quote, to serve as a judge, Oidor, on the Royal High Court of Mexico. The successful Viedma family 
with his three brothers and two the, uh, uh, traveling to uh, America, contrast with the failure of Cervantes' aspiration. For him, the colonies and the metropolis remained separated. But if his 1590 solicitation had been received, perhaps he would have never composed other work than the Galatea, and we uh, perhaps shall not be here tonight. It is why it is with his last and posthumous book, Los Trabajos de Persilas y Sigismunda, published in Madrid in 1607, one year after his death, that Cervantes' work widened its geography and became global. The two first part of this northern story, Historia Setentrional, locates multiple shipwrecks, journeys, adventure, in a northern world, both genuine and imaginary, characterized by furious oceans, frozen seas, barbarous islands, human sacrifice, and lycanthropy. It is only in chapter 12 of the fourth part, which tells who Periandro and Auristela were, that a more precise location is proposed to the reader. Periandro is, in fact, Persiles, one of the two sons of the king of Thule. I quote, the island held to be the last one on earth, at least in this direction, and which is identified in the following chapter as the island now commonly called Groenland. Auristela is Sigismunda, one of the two daughters of the queen of Frieslanda, situated, I quote, farther on practically at the North Pole itself. It is with its third part that this Hellenistic novel written by Cervantes, who wanted to compete with Eliodorus Ethiopica, becomes meridional. The heroes arrive in Lisbon, where they change of clothing and become pilgrims. They spend four days at the monastery of Guadalupe, where they pay devotion to the most holy image of the Virgin and recognize her miracles proved by the ex votos left by all these people who, after having been bowed down by misery, are now alive, healthy, free, and happy. They cross Castile, arrive near Valencia, where they listen to the retrospective prediction of the grandfather sacristan, Morisco himself, but good Christian, according to which, I quote, a king of the royal house of Austria would rule over Spain, one who would have the courage to make the difficult decision to banish the Moriscos from the country. And thus will come the time, according him, when Spain will be holy and firmly Christian everywhere. And it was, of course, this retrospective prophecy for the expulsion of the Moriscos that was decreed in 1609. The pilgrims of the Persiles enter in Barcelona, where they visit the galleys, but not a printing shop, as did Don Quixote in the second part of the uh, 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 Historia. And then they cross Languedoc, Provence. The journey ends in Italy, where they come to halt in Milan, Lucca, and finally Rome, in a year of jubilee, granting a plenary indulgence for all the pilgrims which visited at least four basilicas in the city. Los Trabajos de Persiles y Gismunda were completed by Cervantes on his deathbed, on the eve of his last voyage, at the time of a double farewell. In the dedicatory epistle addressed to the Count of Lemos, dated on April 19, 1616, he wrote, Yesterday I received the extreme unction, and today I write this. Time is short, anxieties increase, hopes lessen, and with all this, I take the life and the desire I have to live. In the prologue, Cervantes departs from the world with melancholy and a paradoxical farewell to his lector amantissimo, his dearest reader. Goodbye humor, goodbye wit, goodbye merry friends, for I am dying and hope to see you soon happy in the life to come, and la otra vida. The dedication of the Count of Lemos <clears throat> is the last dated text written by Cervantes, 
who will die three days after on April 22, 1616. 16. We don't know if the prologue was composed before or after this uh, dedication. The Persiles, published the year after in 1617, 17, enclosed in its textual microcosm the wild and imagined seas of the Septentrion, the Iberian and Italian lands ruled by the Spanish king, the territories of his French enemy, and finally, the most sacred place of the Christendom. Cervantes' Hellenistic romance is a superb example of the power of words for producing geographical ekphrasis. Its fascination, its attraction, is proved by its immediate success. In the same year, 1618, two French translations of the Persiles were published and competing, one by François de Rosset and the other by Vital Dodiguier. In 1619, the first English translation of the work appeared as the travels of Persiles and Sigismunda, a northern history. And the Italian translation came out in Venice in 1626. Geographies of the books, geographies in the books. On the one hand, the maps of the circulation of the works drawn by the historian or the literary critic. On the other hand, the fictional spaces inscribed by the author within his or her text. Can we link, and would be my conclusion, can we link these two perspectives? Perhaps, if we pay attention to a phenomenon forgotten by Moretti, the presence of maps in the books themselves. It is true that until the end of the 18th century, none of the edition of Don Quixote, the exemplary novel, or the trials of Persiles and Sigismunda had a map, or at least a printed map. The power of words is considered as so strong that it can make redundant or useless the presence of illustration or the presence of maps. The images must be produced by the word and inscribed in the mind of the reader. When the words are considered as able to produce in this reader's mind the presence of places, events, character, there is no need for actual images. However, in 1780, Joaquin Ibarra decided to insert a map of the three journeys or salidas of the Hidalgo in the edition of Don Quixote he printed in Madrid for the Real Academia de España. This uh, edition, including a map, was republished two years later in a cheaper in octavo format. The first one was an inquarto. The edition printed for the Real Academia insisted on the exactness of Don, Quixote, Don Quixote's travels. The map in the edition has been established con toda exactitud, with full accuracy, by Thomas Lopez, geographer of the king, on the basis of the observation made on the ground by José de Hermosilla, who was captain in the Royal Corps of Engineers. The 35 places located on the map were following the chronological uh, structure of the Quixote, the Plan Chronologico del Quixote, established by the editor, Vincente de los Rios, who supposed that uh, Don Quixote was a contemporary hero and contemporary of Cervantes and of the reader of the uh, uh, book, and that Don Quixote has made his three salidas, three salis, his three journeys during the year 1604. This chronological and geographical precision allowed Vincente de los Rios to correct Cervantes' narration. In chapter 9 to 11 of the second part, Cervantes, according to him, wrongly placed in October la octava del corpus, a feast celebrated in June. And he said wrongly that the adventure occurred in the area of T Toboso, happened when the hero and his squire were going north. Whereas this adventure supposed an itinerary in a contrary direction. In his commentary on chapter 29, Vincente de Lorio stressed that, I quote, it was not possible that Rocinante and Sancho's donkey could have made such a distance 
in such a short time. Aquí cometió Cervantes un notable hierro de geografía. Here Cervantes made a big geographical mistake. The editor established thus a meticulous list of all the geographical errors, anachronism against the chronology of the fiction itself, negligence and lacks of very similitude uh, of Cervantes. Cervantes' errors and costlessness were generally exposed by the comparison between the distances measured on the map and the time allowed by the author for the journeys between one place and another. Actual geography provides thus the criteria for checking the accuracy and frequently the inaccuracy of the fiction. A second map of Don Quixote's travels engraved by Manuel Antonio Rodriguez, was inserted in Juan Antonio Pellicer edition printed in 1798 in Madrid by the famous printer Gabriel de Sancha. It presented the map of Don Quixote travels as based on the historical observation made by Juan Antonio Pellicer, who was a librarian of the King uh, and a member of the Royal Academy of uh, History. What is interesting is that Pellicer abandons the criticism of Cervantes' chronology because, I quote him, we must consider his chronology not as the one of an historian who respects with exactness and reasons the order of times, but as one of a poet who used to invert and disrupt it as did Virgil in Dido, with Dido and Aeneas. In the same manner, Cervantes' geography cannot be exact because, I quote, from a poet, an author of chivalric fable, we must not expect a rigorous respect of geographical laws imposed on the historian and chronicler of true fact. Consequently, Pellicer's observations are erudite notes based on published chronicle and archival documents kept in the library of the Royal Academy and the Academy of History. And among them, for example, the Relaciones Topográficas established for Philip II. The erudite observation filled the silences of the narration. For example, a long historical notice about three towns, Cariñera, Cosuenda, and Sinacorva, is presented by Pellicer as a manner of fulfilling, I quote, a long lack of action and a long silence in Cervantes' narration, as if the editor was writing in the blanks of the books. Pellicer proposed also hypothesis when the history does not give any precision, as for example in the second part about the crossing of the Ebro by the errant knight. He decided also to identify the places of the text. For him, the palace of the dukes in the second part is the very likely the palace of Buena Villa belonging to the dukes of Villahermosa all converses for conjecturing that Don Quixote's hosts were these lords. The presence of genuine maps in a fictional narrative reinforced what Borges called the partial enchantments of Don Quixote that aimed to confuse the world of the text and the world of the reader. The reader is invited by the maps to become a fellow traveler of Don Quixote and Sancho and to experience with them the widening of their horizon from the Campo de Montiel, of Montiel and the Sierra Morena in the first part to the Kingdom of Aragon, Catalonia and Barcelona in the second part. The power of the maps on the imagination is such that even when the reader is convinced that the illusion of the fiction cannot be judged or measured, according chronological and geographical reality, as Pellicer was. Nonetheless, the temptation to inscribe and measure on a map of Spain the actual journeys of a fictional Hidalgo remain very strong. It is perhaps the reason why the presence of map of Don Quixote's travels became common in 19th century edition of the uh, novel. Uh, for example, in America in 1836, the Boston edition followed uh, the map uh, of 1798, and in 1842 in Mexico, the edition followed the map of 1780. I, how to conclude? 
perhaps with the last cartography, another one, not the cartography of the circulation of the book, not the cartography of the drone is made by fictional character, but the cartography of the travels of the author himself. In 1880, Manuel de Foronda published in Madrid a book devoted to Cervantes Viajero, Cervantes Travelers. The map included in the book showed the various travel of Cervantes in Italy, his journeys on the Mediterranean Sea, with the participation in the Battle of Lepanto, his capture near the Baleares, indicated by a small cross, and his captivity in Algiers. Also, the map showed the return of Cervantes in Spain, his journey with his uh, military company to the island of the Azores and Terceras, and finally, his last uh, later travel in North Africa. Thus, Don Quixote's uh, journeys, Persiles' pilgrimage, and Cervantes' uh, travels became, in this sense, thanks to the map, connected history in a global world. Thank you. How could you be delighted to? Thank you so much. Um, can we ask you some questions? Uh, with pleasure. Yes. Um, you mentioned that uh, with, with each new adaptation or translation, the, the work is reinvented. Uh, uh, what new dimensions? the translations add to the to the matter that uh, the the novel itself is supposed to be a translation and an adaptation by Cervantes from the Arabic. Yeah, you are right. Uh, yeah. uh, I forgot to mention this point that uh, since the chapter uh, nine. Uh, the uh, text that it is read is a translation from uh, the uh, text by uh, Sidi Amete Benengeli and uh, uh, with a permanent dissociation because the reader read not only the translation of this text by the, by, written by the uh, uh, Arabigo historiador Sidi Amete Benengeli but also what the reader of the first eight, the first eight chapter comments upon this, uh, this uh, uh, chronicle of the uh, uh, progresses by uh, Don Quixote. So it's both a translation from the uh, Arabic language and also uh, a translation which is an object of a series of comments and the ironic distance or the doubt which is introduced. Or, uh, and so, yeah, of course, everything starts like, uh, like, like a, 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 a translation. Uh, and so you think it's what a matrix for the appropriation by the translator of the, uh, of the text. In a sense, the word, uh, all the uh, uh, form of translator of Sidi Amete Benengeli was, uh, there was this, uh, you, are, you are right, there is this centrality of the problem of translation which is given since the beginning. And as you know, there is an immense literature to know why Chavantes has used this device. Uh, the, the first eight part are uh, uh, the narration of uh, 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 what a reader is reading. In the eighth chapter, this uh, uh, narration is uh, 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 brutally interrupted, and this reader of the first uh, chapter becomes uh, the man who is in search of the continuation. So he goes to Toledo. He encounters his uh, manuscript uh, amidst the uh, Papele Roto de la Calle and asks for the translation. Uh, and so, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this um, model, what was at stake? Uh, for some people, it was a way for imitating a device of the chivalric novels which was often using this uh, device of a supposed translated text. Uh, in other case, uh, it could be the very complex relationship that Cervantes had with the uh, 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 Arabic world from the moment of the uh, uh, capture and the uh, uh, moment in which it could be saved by the Trinitarian. The ambivalent uh, discourse on the 1609 expulsion of the Moriscos, 
because there is a, a strong tension between how this event is present in Don Quixote and in the passage I quoted of the uh, Persiles. And perhaps this uh, 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 idea, which allows also to make to make another uh, irony, because uh, this uh, uh, Arabic chronicler have not the reputation necessary to say the truth. So in fact, it was to introduce in the idea that it is an historia based on documents, something which was uh, distantiating the reader, a form of uh, uh, invitation to uh, both the suspension of disbelief to enjoy the fiction and perhaps to recall that uh, for the reader who can, uh, who can read in this manner that uh, uh, it's a play with the truth. I don't know, but it's a, a very interesting point, this uh, idea. First, it start, it, Don Quixote itself, at, at least from the chapter uh, 9 of the first part, is a translation. And secondly, why it's a translation from the text of uh, 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 Arab chronicle. Uh, <coughs> yes? Uh, I wonder if you would consider uh, uh, Don Quixote as a kind of model system in the way that scientists would consider the fruit fly uh, for understanding translation in the early modern world, or whether you believe it's so exceptional mm. that it cannot, it, it, it is a story that must be studied in, in all of these sort of uh, avenues that are so distinct to the, to the story itself. Mm -hmm. Um, because when you talk about it, it sounds like you're sketching uh, that the, the former, a sense in which you can learn a great deal about yeah. translation itself by just looking at this one. But I wonder for you which one of those uh, is more true, that it's, a, it's the fruit fly for understanding translation, or it's, it is so unique it cannot be yeah. understood other than in itself. Well, yeah, not all the knowledge to answer, but first it seems to me that if you are thinking about uh, your, uh, fiction, there is this, what you say, a form of exceptionality. I cannot imagine uh, any other uh, fictional uh, text, uh, prose or uh, verse, uh, uh, a novel or uh, uh, a play, uh, which could be compared with the uh, immediacy and uh, uh, this immediacy and uh, your, uh, your importance of the translation. But it's not exceptional if you go outside of this, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of, of the fiction. Uh, in this sense, just to, to, uh, before going outside, uh, it's interesting to use Don Quixote to see the uh, um, uh, unevenness of uh, the discrepancy uh, of this uh, uh, textual uh, connection. And uh, 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 because, of course, the strongest uh, uh, contrast would be between uh, 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 the Spanish uh, 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 text, chivalric novel, picaresque novel, pastoral, and Don Quixote, and Comedia, and their uh, uh, immediate and massive presence in translation in France or uh, uh, in England, and uh, uh, compared or contrasted with the uh, uh, absence of the inverted phenomena. Uh, the first translation of uh, 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 Shakespeare play in Spanish is uh, 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 by Ramon de la Cruz in 1780s, it's Hamlet. Ramon de la Cruz didn't know English. So he used a, trans a French translation by uh, Ducis, who didn't know English. And so Ducis used the translation made by De La Porte some years before. So uh, it's just to say that uh, this, uh, it's possible to have this kind of uneven cartography of the uh, global literature. But outside of Don Quixote, I think there are some texts which, uh, which have the same kind of uh, impact and plurality of translation, retranslation. I have studied two. One, uh, Castiglione, Il Libro del Cortegiano. And the second one, Las Casas, Brevissima Historia de la Destruición, Brevissima Relación de la Destruición de las Indias. And you can follow exactly. Uh, and in both cases, you, you can see different scale of work on the translation. In the, uh, in the case of Cortegiano, uh, uh, one of the main issues was 
how to translate <laughs> this uh, quite neologism of Sprezzatura. And so you can follow, I have tried to do this, to follow all the difficulties. And to, to sometimes it's surprising because uh, Sprezzatura exists because it opposed to Gaffetazione. And for some translators, particularly in Spanish, or uh, 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 even in English, the word affectation is not easy to translate. Whereas the, uh, the word sprezzatura in Spanish, sprezzatura, desprecio, descuido, you can construct exactly the same uh, form of uh, negativity of something which is traditionally considered as positive. But here you have. Uh, 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 the translation, uh, the first one in Boscan uh, in Spain in the 1532, uh, uh, after you have two French translations, you have uh, two uh, 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 English uh, translations, and even phenomena which seems to me interesting and perhaps under study the translation into Latin at the end of the 16th century. There are some uh, translations by uh, uh, German and uh, English professor of uh, El Cortegiano into, into Latin. Alors, it's an example. In the, uh, and in this case, it could be the, uh, the, the, the variation or the mobility could be uh, directly connected on with this, the difficulty at the scale of some word, and particularly this uh, cop couple of words, affetazione uh, sprezzatura, or the variation which are connected to the mobility uh, linked to the materiality of the text. Because the history of the Cortegiano in Italy in the 16th century is to shift from a text which has no notes, no apparatus, no table, as a kind of continuous conversation in which the reader could be quite uh, uh, participate to a, a book in which more and more you have index, table, recapitulation, which allows a discontinuous reading and which allow uh, use of the text for excerpting commonplaces, for an, and but at the same time, uh, which uh, is liberated from the movement of the conversation. So for me to, to analyze the, 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 the translation is one of this chapter in the history of the mobility of the text. Alors, in this case of Il Cortegiano, the uh, textual mobility linked with the materiality of the text and the difficulty or complexity of the translation are the, uh, the key answer. In the case of Las Casas, which is also perhaps still more impressive than, uh, uh, than uh, uh, Il Cortegiano, uh, the mobility is, is connected not with the translation in another language, but uh, uh, a detail, for example, in many of the chapters, uh, Las Casas used the uh, Los Cristianos when he described the uh, denounce, the conquistadores. He used, it seems to me, with uh, uh, bitter irony, the word Cristianos. Not only because all these conquistadores were not necessarily Spaniards, there was one an example in the text of a German, but also because it's uh, to, 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 to show that these supposed Cristianos are not really Christianos because they uh, don't uh, Christianize the Indian and finally uh, led this uh, soul of millions of people, 12, 15 million of people, uh, without the possibility of salvation. And so this, uh, uh, the word Christianos was in the Protestant translation of the late 16th century, uh, Dutch, French, and English, uh, systematically substituted by uh, uh, the Spanish the Spaniards. There was no more Christianos, and it's only the uh, Spanish. And if you look at the uh, more recent edition in Penguin, uh, in where in Las Casas you have Christianos, in the same sentence, in all the Protestant translation, you have uh, Sp Sp Spanish, Spaniards. Here, in this translation, you have the Europeans. <laughs> which seems to me a very curious effect of uh, post-colonial studies on the text of uh, La Las Casas. So you can follow this. Uh, what is also important in the case of Las Casas is the, 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 the text is transformed uh, outside of itself by the multiple context of its uh, translation and uh, edition. But here you have uh, Dutch, German, French, Italian, uh, yeah, and Latin at the end of the, uh, uh, not Latin, no, 
but these old uh, languages are, uh, yeah, are used and with a series of retranslation, which is really uh, yeah, fascinating. Uh, uh, in English, for example, there was a first translation, which was a translation of the French translation, 1583, the Spanish colony, the translation of the translation by the Protestant Migrod in France. But in the 1656, the Civil War, uh, new translation by whom John Phillips, the same who will retranslate the Don Quixote uh, 30 years after. And when he translate, uh, he retranslated the first translation, and it's, of course, in new Spanish, so it's from the original text by uh, uh, Las Casas. Another form of mobility, the fact that the, in the case of Las Casas, they have no similar title for this uh, your text from one language to another one. And when you retranslate, it's no more the Spanish colony, which was already an interpretation of the text in a context of uh, diplomatic, colonial, uh, military uh, 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 struggle between Spain and England, but he retranslated with the tears of the Indian, which was not only a reference of a previous book, which was about the massacre of the uh, Irish Protestant by the Catholic, but also it started immediately with a biblical quotation. It's uh, Jeremiah. And so the text is located in the biblical register of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the war. And the text uh, yeah, is used for uh, showing uh, uh, Cromwell as a new David, which will redeem the uh, soul of the Indian deprived of the uh, uh, salvation. So I think these two examples, uh, are, and, uh, and the last one I could quote a little later is the uh, 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 translation of the book of Baltazar Gracian, Oraculo Manual y Arte de Prudencia, uh, 1647, Wesca, translated by uh, Amlo de la Housse in French, 1684. Uh, uh, and what is fascinating, it's uh, this book becomes a general a book describing the uh, practices of the court in all Europe, but on the basis of the translation of the translation by Amlo. And Amlo have decided the title for the book, L'Homme de Cour. And if you read Gracian, there is not a single time in which the word corte appears. So in this case, the translation is a complete, complete reinterpretation of the text. But as if before AMLO only existed two editions of an Italian translation, Oraculo Manuale, Arte de Prudenza, which were forgotten, the book became, for the entire Europe, a kind of manual of the court psychology because there was no return to uh, the uh, uh, Spanish original. And it was the manner in which uh, uh, Norbert Elias, as you know, I liked uh, the work and I admired Norbert Elias, has read this book because he has never read uh, Gracian. And he said, Gracian has written the first uh, manual for the court psychology in early modern Europe. And he, had, he attributed this to a book in which the word court never appeared. So just three examples, it seems to me, which reduce the exceptionality of uh, uh, Don Quixote. Yes? From the very title of the novel, Don Quixote de la Mancha, from the very name of the character, if there is a very clear geographical uh, mark there, which probably, if, I mean, part of the anti-heroic yeah. construction of the character and I, from your the, the first part of your lecture you, you paid very close attention to different translations to what extent would you say that that uh, part I mean it's not that it, of course it was ignored but was it maybe less relevant in translations than it was in the in the original uh, Spanish text would you have that that uh, impression? I mean, my hypothesis would be that for international readers, yeah. maybe the placement in La Mancha wouldn't make that much sense as it made. made. So, no, right, would not make the same, the same sense. What we meant, it's because it was framed on uh, 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 Amadis de Gaula, and it was a way for immediately introducing an irony. And even if a reader don't know exactly where were the Mancha and uh, El Campo de Montiel, La Sierra Morena, he perceived 
this irony, the fact that uh, uh, this uh, hero is a hero of a, a known limited uh, backward uh, territory. And so even if that the uh, same resonance that for a Spanish reader, nevertheless, he was always kept. In all the titles, he was never transformed. Manche or Mancha uh, identify very fastly uh, the Don Quixote de la Manche. And so no one has, uh, has transformed. But you are right, because it, to, 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 sh to stress this point, that is to say, if we enter into the horizon of expectation or reception, of course, we have to measure what effect could be produced by the same word, mancha, on a reader who have no idea where is a mancha and why there are this, uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, what is the resonance for a Spanish reader of the 17th century. But nevertheless, it's like the, the question of Sidi Ahmed Ben Henry. It's the idea that immediately is perceivable this uh, uh, the ridiculous uh, uh, at, at, uh, association between an heroic figure uh, and uh, 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 the very limited territory uh, uh, used for naming himself. So I suppose it was this, uh, the, but so to answer, there was never uh, the substitution of another kind of limited uh, province or part of a country to a mansion. Yeah, I don't know where I can. <laughs> Please. Thank you um, for a wonderful lecture. And my question is whether in your reconstruction of editions and reinventions of Don Quixote from the 17th to the 18th century, do you see a decrease in readership in favor of public spectatorship, especially by the 18th century with creation of so many opera librettos, mm -hmm. or was, was, there, was that a parallel activity to readers? Um, now, I would say more parallel activity, because as uh, we have seen this uh, theatrical adaptation uh, follow very closely the uh, trend of the uh, publication, the Guillén de Castro and the first edition. Uh, in England, Shelton, 1612, the play by uh, uh, Shakespeare, perhaps, and Fletcher uh, in 1613. Uh, the French play of the 1620s and 1630s. So, you have the, the two uh, elements are, uh, are, are uh, largely parallel, it seems to me. It's not a substitution one to the, uh, to, to the other. Perhaps what is clear, it's uh, when the, uh, the, 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 all the adaptation, theatrical adaptation I mentioned of the second part has reinforced this uh, in the uh, 18th century. And uh, perhaps because the uh, 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 windmill was a little worn out and everyone knows this, they uh, decided to focus uh, comedies, opera, uh, 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 théâtre de la foi on the second part, which was a, a form to reintroducing uh, Sancho, uh, uh, Gracioso de Comedia, comic character, and uh, 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 in, a, in a sense, to be more original in relation with the uh, stereotype of Don Quixote. Alors, in this sense, yes, you could say that there are uh, a form of uh, emancipation of the theatrical uh, adaptation in the 18th century, focusing on this uh, episode less known of the second part. I like particularly the Portuguese adaptation by Antonio José da Silva, which was done for the uh, theater of the... Uh, Bonifrates, Bonecos for the uh, marionettes or the puppets in, the, uh, in Lisbon, because he, uh, he, he used with a great subtlety uh, the episode of the second part and uh, sometimes made interpolation with uh, uh, text less known of, uh, by Cervantes, El Viaje del Parnaso, which is introduced in the, in the play because Don Quixote and Sancho are going to the Parnassus to defend Apollo against the bad uh, the poetaster, the bad poet. So there is a, an invention around the second part in the 18th century. But it's, what is striking is the immediate uh, appropriation. But with this, with this qualification, that is to say, even when in the play you have Don Quixote, nevertheless, a main topic 
for we can suppose the English play and the French uh, play, yeah, the first one, are the love story of uh, Cardenio, Lucinda, Fernando, and Dorothea, as if they have decided to excerpt from the historia what was easier to stage, because you can have a narrative which starts with a beginning as a end, happy end in this case, uh, where yes, to stage Don Quixote is much more complicated. And, uh, of the actual text. I was curious about the materiality of the book and the various editions. Does it always stay in false, small format, octavo, duodecimo, or does it actually transform into different formats? Does everyone, anyone ever make a folio Don Quixote, for example, which would be really fun to read? But... There, was one, there was one, the, uh, uh, the, the first edition is the uh, 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 octavo, if I remember correctly. Uh, but the uh, re-edition of Shelton in 1652 in England is a folio. So the first folio, if I can say, for Don Quixote uh, was in English. It's a particular work in text because the first series of systematic illustrations accompanying the chapter in is the Dutch translation, 1657. This uh, first folio was uh, in the uh, re-edition. Uh, there is a great importance, it seems to me, of Don Quixote in the Civil War. We have seen the text by Gaetan, the use of the, uh, all these new, wor new words to be Don Quixote, uh, uh, Quixotic, uh, uh, so, and there was this uh, uh, folio, it's a small folio, but it's a folio, the vessel is uh, uh, by Chilton. After the question becomes more how to associate the first part and the second part. And uh, yeah, yeah, uh, in two volumes, uh, or uh, uh, put together, which obliged to change the title. And it's a moment in which uh, uh, started in Spanish, the title has been the uh, Hechos de uh, Don Quixote de la Mancha, The Life and uh, Exploits of uh, Don Quixote de la Mancha. Uh, and in the uh, 18th century, uh, what was the main novelty was uh, uh, to use a very large format quarto, which is quite as, as big than a small folio. Uh, and in this uh, uh, canonical edition of 1738 in London by uh, uh, Thompson and uh, by uh, Pay, by Lord Carteret, which is four volumes. And for the first time, there is a life of Cervantes by uh, Gregorio Mayan Sisiska. And there are two uh, uh, portraits of Cervantes, one which is more or less uh, uh, natural portrait representing Cervantes. The difficulty was to represent the crushed hand of uh, Cervantes. He was not completely uh, without the end, but uh, it was not very, uh, he cannot use his uh, left hand uh, since the battle of Lepanto. Uh, and another, which is an allegory, Cervantes going just uh, to the, uh, uh, to uh, encountering uh, uh, Apollo uh, and uh, uh, destroying all the chimera of this uh, uh, monster of the uh, chivalric novel. So in this edition of 1738, you have the Spanish text with a rigorous philological uh, edition. You have what started, uh, that is to say, the man and the world, the life and the world, which start uh, in this case with this Bida, uh, uh, right, with Gregory Mayan Sisiska. Uh, and uh, you, uh, uh, you have, uh, I suppose, the uh, reason why the Real Academia, uh, at the end of the 18th century, want to make this first edition in Quarto with the uh, uh, map. Uh, in order to compete later with this uh, English edition of the Thompson, which is another relation because the Thompson were the uh, uh, publisher of Shakespeare. Mm. So you can find here uh, the, the, an account of the edition of the, the edition of the uh, Don Quixote is uh, uh, absolutely uh, one of the first philological and also typographical, uh, particularly uh, 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 with a lot of care in this edition. Alors, after the uh, Don Quixote and Folio, I suppose, through the 19th and still more 20th century, it would be uh, more common. More and more, when you have the uh, illustration, we need space for uh, to be given. Uh, 
I am sure there are more questions, but I think we should wrap it up now that we've come back to Shakespeare. Uh, Cervantes has a folio as well. And let's thank um, Professor Sean Tiega. Thank you. Thank you very much.